Now I just feel like yeah. telling Imran <laughs> University stories. <laughs> so, I mean, but we'll stick to manufacturing in Africa. Um, I travel Africa a lot. I travel to multiple countries every single year. And I just want to make a couple of points just to really set the context here before we do a deep dive with our excellent panel. There is a real sea change in Africa from the government to the private sector to entrepreneurs, uh, especially among creatives. There's a change in attitude and there's a change in pride of being Kenyan, Nigerian, Ethiopian. Uh, we all embrace our diversity now more than ever. And we want the rest of the world to recognize that there are 54 countries on the continent of Africa. We like to tell everyone Africa is not a country when they come visit or, or start a conversation about Africa. And, 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 and we feel very strongly and passionately about this. So uh, that's, that's one really important thing to bear in mind. We don't like so much the stereotypes anymore, and we, we want to be approached um, in a diverse and sophisticated way. Um, the second point that I think you'd find interesting is that uh, the continent recently, actually just a few months ago, uh, assigned something that was a really big deal. Uh, it, it is the largest free trade agreement in history. It's known as the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. And um, this is something that is going to change the future of the continent. It is something that we're seeing in Africa as the world is increasing barriers to trade, Africa is breaking them down. When you look specifically at the manufacturing sector today, only 10% of Africa's GDP is in the manufacturing sector. And it's believed that with the Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, there's going to be a significant boost, particularly to small and medium-sized businesses, which employ, I think I'd say, about 80% um, of people on the continent. So that's just a little bit of color and context that I wanted to set. Uh, Omoyemi, let me start with you, though. Can you explain to us what the manufacturing landscape looks like today in Africa? Um, currently, I guess that's a mix of different things. I mean, if we look at a recent McKinsey report that tells us that um, manufacturing on the continent has the potential to increase from about $500 billion to a $17 trillion economy. Um, it certainly helps to put in perspective the potential of what exists. And while that might cover manufacturing in its biggest form, um, when we sort of dissect and go deep down, we start to think about apparel manufacturing and the role that um, textile and apparel manufacturing can play with that, considering the fact that um, when the value chain is functioning properly, it has a uh, potential to create hundreds of thousands and possibly millions of jobs for women and youth across Africa, which is quite important today, considering um, A, the youth population in Africa, B, considering the number of people who still live below the poverty line. Um, so it's quite interesting that um, our gradually evolving ecosystem is special and unique because it's really dependent on A, our natural resources, and B, human resources which is where oftentimes, you know, there's sort, of a, there's sort of a problem, how to ensure that we create like a careful balance between the people, the processes, and the resources that contribute to making the billions or millions of clothing that we see that light up our runway from Nigeria to South Africa to Ethiopia and beyond. Uh, currently, things are very fragmented. Um, it's not all it's not all super interesting. So we have the big corporates um, opening uh, textile and apparel manufacturing firms in cities across like huge investments, either from Ethiopia to Rwanda to I think Kenya. So what makes it super interesting as well is, yes, these factories exist and they produce for maybe from, your, from PVH Corporation to even designers like Stella McCartney or Vivian Westwood through Artisan Fashion in Kenya. So while they exist and you know, they're creating jobs for people, what's super interesting and maybe ultimately saddening for someone like myself, as, because as fashion business um, development leaders and organizers of Lagos Fashion Week, which is one of Africa's most uh, relevant fashion weeks, yes, we have access to all, the, all of these factories, but it's quite strange that designers, there's, you know, designers don't have access to produce their collections. In the you know based on the number the quantity that in the right quantity, so most of the factories we have today are targeted at exports, which is great for the government because it's foreign you know it generates um, 
foreign revenue. But then again, when you're trying to look, when you see the creativity that exists on the continent and you begin to ask where they're producing, how do they manufacture, for people like ourselves, that's, that becomes like a headache. And, you know, the question, the natural question we're going to ask is how can we support and how can we help? So we went from organizing Fashion Week and being, fashion, uh, being a fashion advisory company to actually getting involved. Uh, and how did we get involved? We're trying to ensure that we connect the dots between the missing gap between the creativity and the industry that's, industry that's required to make it thrive. So how do we bring it all together? How do we um, partner with you know, stakeholders on the scene to A, provide um, manufacturing skills for unemployed youth, and through that process, you know, once you've equipped them with the skills that's required to produce, how do we then you know, begin to understand that we can produce in small, smaller MOQs for designers or you know, people who have smaller smaller runs and to be able to help support their businesses since what currently exists on the continent is the big factories who exist but who are only servicing maybe the companies that you know but we're trying to ensure that the designers also benefit from this process. What's been your experience Leah in Ethiopia? Um, hi. <laughs> Um, so I guess for me it's it's slightly different because we uh, with Lamlam we work with artisans actually. So um, how uh, Lamlam started was and in a way it's interesting when I, even I hear you speaking. I think it's always about I think we all have this uh, way of sort of solving a problem, you know, seeing a process and then creating a solution that you weren't even thinking about. And for me, Lamlam was exactly like that. I uh, in Ethiopia we've always worn traditional. Uh, traditional clothing, which are all handwoven by hand on a loom by a weaver. Uh, he learns the skill from his father, and it goes from father to son. And um, with the westernization and globalization of everything, uh, people started buying less and less of traditional clothing and wearing more and more t-shirts and jeans and things like this in the countryside, even in the cities, especially mostly in the cities. So what that did was all these incredible weavers were not uh, having uh, a place to sell their goods. People were not buying it for them, so they're unemployed. Um, and there's lots of them. And then the art of weaving was dying also, which is really part of our heritage and, and the country. Um, so the idea came to me with it there saying, you know, there, we need to find a solution for this because I don't, you know, it's, it's not fair for this not to work. Um, so I started a line uh, called Lam Lam. Uh, and the whole idea was, okay, here are these incredible weavers, let's train them to, uh, let's take what they know and then let's train them even better and, and then create a, a bigger marketplace for them, which is even outside of Ethiopia. So bringing it actually here and selling it to everyone. Um, so you can have a wonderful weaver sit sitting in Ethiopia making this you know, wonderful shirt and then someone in New York City is wearing it and walking around with it and you're sort of telling a story that's crossing borders. Um, and at the same time, what the idea was, I always worked in philanthropy. I was a W. Cho Goodwill ambassador um, for a while. And uh, one of the things that I saw in philanthropy was there's always a problem of needing to find funds and giving funds. And so for me, the idea was uh, actually there's a sustainable way of doing this, of helping people, a sustainable way of aid, and that is employment, training and employment. Um, and when you hire people and you're giving a job to somebody, uh, that person can earn his living, uh, whether you're there or not and he will also help his own family. Uh, his kids can go to school, they can buy better mm -hmm. homes, they can you know, sort of improve their lives and sort of break this cycle of poverty. Um, so that's sort of what Lam Lam uh, does and is. Um, so let me just get uh, Matt's perspective here, because Matt, you know, like, like China has played a key role on the continent and, and multiple countries and is really boosting the manufacturing sector. Just give us a little flavor about what you do and, and China's role uh, in, this, in this growing sector? Sure, I think um, everyone pretty much know about the Chinese economic miracles of the past 30 years. And then the country has successfully lived 700 million people out of poverty in about 20 years time. And then now since China is on the, the fast track of moving to a high income country in the next five to six years, and then more people are, are forecast that they are expect to have over uh, 85 million drop from manufacturing sectors need to be moved away. And then that's the reason, you know, Africa is pretty much, like we mentioned earlier, Africa got 1.2 billion population. And then we believe that's the next de destination or the, the only place left at work which have the 
biggest potential to become the manufacturing hub for the, for the world. And that's the reason we start our shoe factory in about 2011 in Ethiopia, and that's the, that's the photo. And then we start to making, well, from the day we decide to go to Ethiopia until the, the trial of production, it only took us about three months. And then that's the, the, the Chinese speed. And then in about two years' time, we hired over 4,000 employees, local employees. And then most of them are female and uh, youth. And you can see that all these factories, they pretty much, these 4,000 factories, only about 20 expatriates from other countries, the rest all from the local communities. And then that's, we have made a huge successful, and then that's the reason, you know, uh, since 2015, we start our uh, NGO called Made in Africa Initiative, and then we are currently working with over 10 African governments as the industrialization advisor. What do you advise them? Like, what do you tell the governments? What did you tell Ethiopia? What are you telling Kenya? Like, yeah, we, we advise the government to see once, you know, a lot of them, they have seen the opportunity of, of those manufacturing or those factories moving out from China, but in reality, they don't know how to receive them or how to create a, a friendly, investment friendly environment so that these investors can confidently to bring the investment to the local, uh, to, to the local society and then to create jobs for the locals. And so that's the reason we advise the government how to, you know, how to improve what their, their policies, you know, their, or how to improve their infrastructure, and also how to, you know, how to even how to manage the, the demand from those investors. Omoyemi, has, has, has any of those policy changes had an impact in your view on, um, on the fashion industry across the continent? Yeah, um, that's what I actually struggle with because um, clearly it's beneficial in the sense that it creates jobs. I mean, if you look at um, in Awasa in Ethiopia, for example, there's a huge park, which is a joint venture between the government there and I guess, you know, I'm not sure if it's your company or, you know, uh, one of the big companies. Um, so while that's ongoing, right, we have access to a pool of creative people across the continent who are looking for where to produce, who either have to resort to maybe Turkey or some people have to, you know, still send their things to India just to be able to produce in, you know, the sort of MOQs that's required. So it's great in the sense that it creates the jobs that's required and we're passionate about, I mean, in our, we have a small, it's not quite huge, uh, in collaboration with Nigeria Export Promotion Council, we have a facility like this, um, which we probably about 150 machines, so it's more of a workshop. But our aim is creating, um, initially what we've done thus far is to provide women and youth with skills for employability. So yes, it, it's beneficial because the Nigerian government, for example, is looking in that direction and ensuring that we create parks that can be beneficial for creating jobs and, you know, to ensure that, you know, there's a balance between work that's coming into Nigeria from foreign factories. But where we come in is to ensure that, you know, not only are the corporates, you know, being able to come to produce in favorable conditions, favorable in quotes, right? But what, what, sure. what, what is favorable? I mean, we all know the reality. You know, there's a race to the bottom approach. So people are leaving China because the world is looking at, you know, those sort of countries to ensure that, you know, you re uh, the minimum in um, income rate increases from about $68 a month to possibly about 100 150 200 So our job or our role as catalyst is to ensure that, you know, as manufacturing seems to be moving to Africa, is we have to ensure that, you know, the mistakes that's been made in the past don't happen. So, um, do, do, do you think that um, the future, uh, when it comes to manufacturing, lies in, in the regional integration aspect of things? You know, because I was earlier, I, I was showing you a, a boo boo uh, made by a, a friend of mine, um, and what was interesting about it was that the fabric was from Mali. Mm -hmm. It was manufactured in Senegal, and the embroidery was from Mauritania. I mean, sh is there more of a uh, kind of a pan-African approach one should take to fashion when, 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 we, when we look ahead? Definitely, and, and um, he's way in after I'm, that. I'm no. sure um, yeah. Leah will be able to share her experience, but that's what we're preaching. Like, the continent is vast, right? with human resources. We have um, values, we have skills that's been passed down from generation to generation. That's what, when you think of African fashion, you think of craftsmanship, you think of artisans dotted in communities across, not just in Nigeria, it's not localized in one region. So the vision is to be able to ensure that we tap into that pool of creativity, tap into that pool of network, to be able to create like beautiful
beautiful garments that have history, that have meaning, but uh, most importantly, that creatively and commercially benefits hundreds of thousands of people across the value chain. So in keeping all of that within the continent, you know, so people and not restricted to only African creatives or designers, but to ensure that you know, we maintain that balance that, yes, it's created by us, it's designed by us, it's produced and manufactured by us, of course, with technology that's imported from anywhere else in the world. But we have to be mindful you know, to have a considered approach to make sure that every hand is working on it, but every hand has to benefit. So I'm not yeah, sure. Do you agree? Had, yeah. How do you see it? Um, yes, I mean, absolutely. I think that, um, I mean, for us too, like we, we, we looked at in Kenya, we, we looked in Rwanda, we worked with borders in Rwanda, we worked uh, with beading in Kenya. And um, I think that for me, like one of the challenges that I have um, is I understand, like, I know how much there's incredible craftsmanship across the continent. And I think manufacturing is one side um, that can help. And, it's, and it has its plus and minuses, obviously. Um, and then there's all these workshops and all these incredible artisans that are just sitting there and not really having a place to, uh, um, to get enriched and be in, a, in sort of a, a, a kind of a system uh, where anybody can be, you know, any French brand, could, for example, they could just be like, oh, I'm, I want some gold, you know, beautiful embroidery. I want to look at Kenya and see what kind of embroidery there are. And here's, is the best. here's a group, yeah. um, and we're going <laughs> to... You were gonna, yeah, and but then because it's it's handwork, you know. I think one of the things, for example, is when you think of an Hermès or a Chanel or anything like that, they're doing basically the same thing. They're working with artisans, and it's all handmade. And because of that, everyone sort of understands the value of these products. So then you don't bat an eyelash when you're spending a thousand dollars on a bag or two thousand dollars. It makes sense because it's handwoven by you know wonderful Italian or artisan or Italian French artisan. But then. Immediately when you say, oh, he's a wonderful artisan and he's African, suddenly the, cons the, the, the way you look at it completely changes because in your mind, it's African, so it has to be cheap. cheap. And I want to buy it in a marketplace and it has to be $20, $30. So the minute you say, no, we're actually trying to change that. How do we do that? <laughs> um, I, mean, I think I'm trying to do that uh, with Lam Lam is, again, it's this. It's trying to, first of all, work with a workshop. Uh, with people, have a relationship, very long-lasting long relationship with the same uh, workshop and, make, and ensure that these people are paid well, have a really great um, facility, um, have great working conditions, um, and, they're part of the, and, they're par and they're partners, they're uh, partners with us. Um, I was just there actually two, three days ago, and it was incredible to um, see these women. They're so happy. Yeah. They're so happy because they really understand that we're changing the, even their, their, their dignity, even locally, how they're seen. Suddenly, they're becoming these mm -hmm. professionals, and what they do matters, and it's not just you know, something small anymore. Uh, they can boast that people are wearing their clothes in New York and Paris and whatever, and it's, it's wonderful. Not just the financial aspect of it, but just even, the, even for the local conception for us too. It's all changing even the way we look at African uh, clothes and wanting to support our own uh, our own people and, our, and our, our own products and trying to change the way instead of always looking out to the West for clothes and coolness or whatever looking into within and, and as well and which is what's happened with the whole secondhand industry that we that in uh, in certain countries on the continent right oh yeah definitely and I, and I think um, and just to add a little bit to that there's got to be a paradigm shift right so there's got to be a consciousness in the minds of people when it comes to what you think African fashion is and, or what it should be. We need to, you know, uh, and that's where we're guilty as creatives on the continent because we're really bad at telling our stories. So you live this reality, you know, you, it's your reality, it's your everyday thing. But then if you don't share this with the world, so they're able to sort of lift the veil and look behind and see everyone who's contributing to all the, I mean, the, how lives are changed, how you've you know, invested in communities, how people are empowered with skills, how entrepreneurs come, you know, it's really incredible. But sometimes we make that mistake because we leave it you forget to tell the story, and sometimes that's the beauty of it. That's how you're able to create, you know, a per sorry, a perception change in the minds of people. So when they see a beautiful garment, and it might even be the simplest of shirts or trousers, but when you think about the story behind it, the meaning, the purpose, the lives that have changed, the impact that can be made, then you know it becomes uh, very important. Like last year, we launched a, a campaign for Lagos Fashion Week, and we shot it right in the second-hand goods market. It's called Aswani. 
And a, little, a few people asked us, oh, some designers refused to give us our, their collection. They're like, we don't want our beautiful garments shot on the backdrop of Aswani market because it's second hands. But I'm like, that is our reality. More than 100 million people in Nigeria get their clothes from there. So if we don't begin to create that juxtaposition that's needed for people to understand that for this to rise, there's got to be a slow death to this. And it cannot be a sudden death either because it still creates a source of clothing for people. In like in going Kenya, in, for example, it's a, it's a second-hand clothing industry. It's, it's a huge it's industry. Huge. Like everywhere you go, like that's... That's, that's what and you see, so to phase it out, well. yes. you know, or to, for the government. So it's government got to be a to gradual thing, like increase manufacturing, yeah. increase number of people yeah. who are employed, and so while well, you're taking jobs away from women who've relied on selling their clothes in those markets, or, you know, taking, you know, who, the second-hand market clo uh, clothes quite a few people. So what are you giving them as an alternative? So how many brands can produce yeah. at that price point that's required for people to be able to afford, yeah. So Matt, um, can you talk a little bit about the cost of manufacturing on the continent when it comes to infrastructure, bureaucracy, quality control, training, all of these issues that you've been looking at in your uh, advisory capacity? Okay, I think those questions, well, those challenges are facing not only to the manufacturing, but <coughs> the manufacturing sector, but pretty much every foreign investor. Like, for example, you know, we've been, our factory have been operating four years in Rwanda, and then until today, pretty much like 20 to 30 percent of the product uh, are sourcing from the neighboring countries, and the rest have to come from Turkey, India, or, ch or China. And also because I'm not sure whether you're aware that if I'm sending a container from Western, Western Africa to Eastern Africa, it actually costs longer time and then at least triple the cost mm -hmm. than sending them from China or India, which like three times further away. So that's the logistic cost is a, is a really huge, huge issue. And then sometimes the inland transportation cost is more expensive than the shipping cost. Which, but you know, that's what we're trying to still working on with not only the African government, but also a lot of the NGO to try to reduce the trade barrier and to, to, to improve the efficiency of the, the customer clearance. But you know, that's, we're still working on it, but you know, that's because there's, there'll never be a perfect time if a lot of the other investors think, okay, I'll probably wait another few years until they believe Africa is ready. But you know, we don't agree, really agree with them. That's the reason. That's the reason you know, we already have uh, three factories in, in well, four, four factories actually in Africa already. What do and you see as the biggest opportunity from your perspective? Yes, yes, I believe because you know a lot of people ask whether why we choose Africa because, but actually we think it's not we choose Africa, it's Africa choose us because they are already ready f to make the, make the product for the rest of the world. And also the quality and also the, the, the everything I think is now is ready for a lot of the uh, orders or even the, the, the quality and also the, the design. We know a lot of the, the, the African local designers are working together with us because you know, they're trying to, to promote not only the their own design, but the, uh, the whole Africa made or made in Africa concept to, to the older global buyers. But just in fact, we have been uh, promoting the, the made in Africa product in uh, different venues around the world. But actually, a lot of the, the international buyers or those big brands, they still haven't seen the point mm -hmm. that Africa is ready or they haven't okay. really, well, they may see it, but they haven't placed order to African manufacturers. So that's the key problems. I'd like uh, each of our panelists to offer a final thought, uh, just to wrap up this discussion. Omoyemi, if you can start by just telling us what you think uh, the most important point you would like to make when it comes to the fashion industry and the continent today in the manufacturing space. Okay, um, I think for me, um, yes, uh, upper manufacturing can thrive in Africa because we, um, to a significant extent, it's important for us for, because it can be a source of job creation, wealth creation, it can create the linkages we want between communities and more. However, this is also where we need to be extra careful to ensure that, you know, um, I keep saying this, that we, there must be a careful balance between the people who need to work, that work behind the scenes, between the processes involved, and of course the resources, you know, to ensure that 
right from sourcing to designing to garment manufacturing to distribution to everything that we need to do that everyone benefits and everyone is really considered and thought about. Um, it's not just about saying, yes, Africa can be the next destination for manufacturing in Africa. It's to ensure that we get it right. You know, it's to ensure that you know, we can use it to lift as many people as possible from poverty, but at the same time to be able to tell a beautiful story about who we are, where we're from, the skills that we have or possess that can you know, change apparel, change lives. And you know, because I remember in 2012, Imran, um, in Florence, you asked me a question, one sentence on fashion. And this was before we even started doing anything with um, you know, training people. And I said, fashion can change lives. And Imran, you said to me, that's interesting, Amoyemi. What do you mean by fashion can change <laughs> lives? But fashion can change lives, where I'm from. You know, we work, we've trained over 600 people till yeah. date. We have people, I mean, one of the women just had a baby and, you know, she started work like three months after. And I'm like, why are you back at work? And she's like, she needs the money. So yes, she might be, be getting paid benefits, but we've literally seen in our small, small workshop, because I dare not call it a factory, we see how it changes lives, how mothers come to say thank you, um, how families are fed just from there. So it's something that we really need, but we have to do it properly. And briefly, Imran mentioned uh, Vogue Africa. Should there be a Vogue Africa? Oh, no. You want me to be controversial? <laughs> <laughs> Not today. <laughs> Shall I answer that for you? <laughs> we'll talk about that. <laughs> Exactly. Well, so, I, I mean, it, it I mean, often goes down like a lead balloon, the concept of a Vogue I Africa mean, it, it's, for it's, African designers, right? You know, you know the conversation we had last night at dinner, and I'm like, I'm African. I live in Lagos. If we want to have an event outside Nigeria, and we are Lagos Fashion Week, I can just get my team, and then we go straight to Ghana. But we don't do that. We understand the nuances that exist between different African countries. I understand that enough to call people, collaborators, communities in Accra to let them know, listen, this is what we're thinking of doing as Lagos Fashion Week. Can we collaborate with you? Can we partner with you? We go to Dakar. Dakar you know, Senegal is francophone. It's completely different. If we'd attempted to host an event there without partners on ground, it would have been an epic fail. So knowing all of that, what I know, we've done the same as well in where? Where have we been? Like Kenya, you know. It's yeah, you haven't been in Ethiopia, I see. I, well, <laughs> you don't, you know, I don't been, know why I've that is. I've been to Addis, you know, we're, <laughs> working, we're working on that. It's important. Me, yeah. Partnership is important across different regions. There are nuances yeah. that you have to... I mean, in Nigeria, people don't RSVP. Guess what? In Dakar, apparently, it's important to, you, you know, so there are different things. People respond to emails. People don't in different places. So how do you decide that you're going to create a, I mean, something that's that huge? Is it going to be in French? Is it going to be in English? Is it going to be in Portuguese? And I know there are ways around it, and I know it's coming with the best intention because, you know, we all, real, we, we all rely on some of these machines to be able to get our voices heard but it's got to be done with a bit more clarity, a bit more thought, a bit more consideration for Africa. It's unique. Thank you. Final thought, Leah? Um, I mean... Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is it, Jenke? <laughs> you like to ask, you like to ask her, her a question? That's what you want? Okay. Uh, hold on. Maybe Iman, that will give okay us our final uh, time. Oh. Yeah. yeah really Could I just get the panel to wrap at least and yeah. then perhaps... Yeah. Well, it's, it's a very important question. I <laughs> think <laughs> it deserves to be asked. Um, you know, 1.2 billion people, 54 countries, and uh, we all know, you know, what connects us as African. It's our history, you know, from slavery to colonization, etc. 70% uh, of the population is under 30, 50 under 20. Um, I appreciate, you know, all the infrastructure and like, you know, economic strategy that are being uh, employed to, uh, to, so we can be part of the development. But my question to you is, how do, you how do we preserve the nobility of the made in Africa? The way we consume, the way our culture is set up, is very different from, you know, the Western world. And how do we take that into consideration and not replicating things that work in other countries but are completely different from our way of life? Okay, you know, so how, how do you preserve made that's in kind Africa? Of my and final that's, that's your I final point. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for my final Merci. thought. <laughs> um, well, I, I believe um, that um, actually working 
in small, uh, with small, small businesses, small workshops, small ateliers, and really uh, encouraging and training. We do a lot of training as well. And um, taking what we know how to do already, right? All this beautiful craftsmanship. I think the idea that, of course, I understand the importance of manufacturing. And the, I mean, they will, the way they can employ people, you know, all these workshops cannot, you know, employ that kind of a quantity. But then again, it's, um, there's this you know, idea like we don't have to replicate the same thing. Um, why not learn from that and also uh, look into Africa for a different model? And the different model can be already this sort of between countries as well. I still feel that we're quite siloed and I still feel like I don't know what's going on in, in, in Nigeria and you might not know what's going on in Ethiopia, but we're still, we need that to be a lot more fluid, uh, the information to travel along. But then also, not just information, but sourcing, supply chain, all that kind of stuff is not, a, there's not a simple place to go to if I want to make something in Madagascar or, or Senegal or something. I don't even know who to call, what to, you know, I can't Google it. I, now I know she knows everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so I'm calling does. her for everything. <laughs> uh, but the stuff that she doesn't know, I don't okay. know where else to go to. And not just for me, but anybody else who wants to start a business in that way, it would help us so much if there was an entity that could um, uh, put all this together, and also, not just that, but uh, training is so important, training. Uh, but training of, of skills in, in, in craftsmanship already that we know, and, and, and giving a, a market for those, for those goods, whether it's locally and internationally, I think would be a good way to, to preserve the nobility of Made in Africa. Yeah, thank you for that. Matt, final thought. Okay, um, <laughs> great. Um, basically, uh, firstly, it's really my great honor to be here. And then, you know, I pretty much have a zero skill about fashion design or anything. And uh, trust me, you don't want to see my painting. It's so awful. <laughs> but, you know, fashion for me, for me have a different meaning to a, a lot of you because fashion to me means million jobs and a million families in Africa, you know, who may only earn a few dollars a day. But, you know, at least they have an opportunity to... To, to, to live in a, in, a, in a better life because before we, we, go, we go there and then they have, a, they have a no jobs and no income at all. But now they have a nice food and we offer them uh, two meals a day and also we give them a, 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 a nice place where they can work and also we hire a lot of local designers to design some or to bring some of the African concept or the cultural concept into the product that we are making not only for the domestic African market but but also for the international buyers. And therefore, you know, I've also bring some of the, the product. Uh, trust me, I'm, I'm not trying to, try to sell this one today. <laughs> some of the product that's made by our factory in Senegal is for, uh, a, U for a US brand. And then the quality and the material is so perfect. And then just, you know, Africa is ready for all the designers, for all the manufacturers, all the buyers that we're welcoming everyone to place the order, but not to uh, no, not only to us, but to <laughs> every manufacturer. <laughs> and then another really okay. important yeah. factor is, finish. you know, we need yeah. to be, be the region, you know, why we need to be careful or to, to promote more people going to or invest in Africa, you know, because from this nice pen, the manufacturer and the local team uh, only make about 60 cent profit. That's all. This one sell at $30 in the US, but actually the manufacturer in Africa only makes 30, 60 cent from it. So Thank we need more orders to survive and we need more orders for, to develop the African economy. Thank you very much, Matt, Leah, Moyemi. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>